Bwana asifiwe. Bwana asifiwe. You know you have just mumeni bamba. Unajua when you sang the happy birthday for my husband, I think I already like you. <laughs> if you want to be friends with your mother, love your father. And I can tell you, he will be here sooner than you think. The First Lady, Kilifi County, Suzanne Mungalo, the Area Member of Parliament, Owen Bayer, Fathers of Faith, led by Bishop Maisha, and our brothers from the Muslim community, Sheikh Rashid, the Vice Chancellor, Puan University, Deputy Vice Chancellor, members of the University Management Board and members of the Senate, professors of the university and the teaching staff, the non-teaching staff, our DCC and the security team that is here with us today, our stakeholders from the Psychologists Association and the Drug Coalition, distinguished guests, my boys and my girls, how are you this afternoon? Habarizenu, wazemko, mazea komta. I'm very happy to be here today, and I must say that when I come and I see the kind of overcharge energy here, we were just uh, speaking and whispering with the Vice Chancellor, and we were saying this manner of energy, if it is misdirected, it can become very dangerous. The way you are jumping and, you know, just, I wish, just like the first lady, I was young again, but I've tried. Many times when I go and I tell you that I also have a boy child in my house, of course, he always sends me with the greetings. He's the truthful man and the one and only Giji. Do you receive his greetings? Why are you crapping like that? The rig G. If you look, I look quite young. And uh, he has not even made any scratch on my face. He's not a master of gender violence. <laughs> He's a very loving man. And I could tell that you read from my Facebook, I was... I was talking about a loving husband, and this is one of the things that I want my sons to be. Men who will grow up, and men who will be fathers, men who will be leaders, great men of substance. Just the way I saw you handsome and just full of energy, a mother feels energized by just seeing you doing the right thing. And when I saw, and I see you, because I can see all of you at a glance, and actually I think more men are here than the girl children. Where are my girl children? Don't be jealous, you know, I love you also. You see, the girls are very few, and therefore I can feel at home. I am a mother of two boys, and of course now the truthful man and the one and only G lives there, and I'm only the queen in the house. And for 36 years I have lived with the boy child, and of course the others are 33 and 31 years. My last born is 31 years, he's Dr. Keith. And 
having lived with the men around me, sometimes I find myself just simply gravitated towards the man. And when I became the second lady, in my inauguration median uh, interview, they asked me, what will you do when you become the second lady? And I said, without thinking, the boy child will be my number one priority. <laughs> and so I'm an advocate, unashamedly, an advocate of the boy child. And I'm putting an affirmative action for the boy child. I will advocate the boy child cause because I believe it is worth doing so. For the longest as parents, as communities, and even as a nation, and even the nations of the world, we did get into a space and we created an era that we regret today. As a mother, I can tell you, every time I come and I stand and I look the direction that the boy child has taken, the man who is supposed to be a father and the man who is supposed to be the seed carrier, the one who will be able to propagate and make sure that a community thrives and it doesn't take itself to extinction, has been driven to oblivion and we were happy and we are just keeping quiet and we think things are right. Our boy children are brought up in a different way from a girl child. I've watched in families where there is a boy and there is a girl growing together. You will find the parents will come and pamper the girl so much, come here, mommy, and all that, and the boy is walking, watching from the sides. When he tried to come, he's told, go away, you know? And he grows not being loved or knowing what love is. Anytime, even in culturally, you find that the man has to be relegated to chores that take him away from the house, taken away from the family, you will find he's a cattle herder out there when there is somebody who has to drop from the school. It is a boy who will be the first victim. And in our culture, we say the boy child uh, way is always up the hill. He goes up the hill until he dies. Why on the other side we put the girl child from the top of the hill and she comes down sliding. And no wonder that when the boy is trying to climb up and the girl is riding down, they never meet. And it is a sad affair. Our ch boy children, when we are bringing them up, we do not teach them how to be connected with the emotions. We tell them they shouldn't cry because crying is for women. They smile, you tell them don't smile like women. They don't cry, they don't express themselves. Anytime they come nearer the kitchen, they are told kitchen is for the women. So the women continue to eat in the kitchen and the young boys start to wait until everyone has eaten, that is when they come. Should they want to express themselves and they speak with one another, they are told not to gossip like women. And therefore, our young people have grown without connection with their emotions, and for that reason, we have brought up people who are actually, not deliberately, they don't know how to love. And then there comes a girl who meets this boy and wants to be loved the way she has been loved by the family, the way she has been brought up. But the boy has no clue what this lady is all about. 
And you can see, as we have been continuing to do all these things, the boy is very frustrated because they go, they find girls who are asking for what they cannot offer, and the girls also are frustrated because they are expecting them to do something different. And I believe it is time that we changed. And I think the boy is having challenges that whose source is parenting. And therefore, we must start to address the way we parent our children. Both the boy and the girl should be brought up with equal opportunities. If the father has to do something for the girl, let him also do the same for the boy. And I don't know whether I am, I'm addressing the real issues here, but I believe that is a source of the problems that we are having. The other thing, if, you, if should a man die, or the father die, it is the man who is the boy, no matter how young, they have to take over the family. So the responsibilities that are placed on the man are high. And then, of course, with the society that we are creating, the materialistic world which we are living, our girls who want our men to be rich, even when they are in the university, even while after they have just graduated our vice chancellor. I don't know what business you are giving to our young men that would make them so rich as to have the V8s and also have land and have houses so that when they get there, they can get a wife. When they try to get to our girls, our girls have become seriously materialistic. And so the boy now finds himself trying to compete with the girls, and the stories of the mumamas and mubabas are full in our university. The sugar mummies, the sugar daddies, it is just something that is very frustrating to a mother when I watch and I see the kind of environment our children have to grow. And we have to look and see how we change the environment we are bringing up our children. Some of them who come here to the university, they are coming pretty young. And without the protection and the accommodation that is decent, they have to live within the environment of the campus. And most of the places where they stay is not conducive for our children. And as you may know, we have people who are absolute, wicked, demonic people who are living around this campus. They are the ones who are opening bars everywhere. If you go around here, you will find all manner of drinking and fun places, and our children become captive. Some of them, they start drinking, thinking it is a joke. And they just try, because they are young, and they are adventurous, and it is okay for them to do that. But in due time, they will pay for what they started to, th to, to sample for pleasure and for just testing to know that and to prove that they have matured and they can do things what their mothers and their parents said they should not do. Many of them, especially in our universities, great number of them are now in addiction. And the addiction is a serious, serious health hazard to our children. Now, the mental illness. The other year when I went to one of the universities, we found that out of all these addictions and frustrations they are going through, 55 in one campus had committed suicide in one year. 
And that is when I knew I needed to rise up. And most of them were boys. And it is very sad. Vice Chancellor, you go to the wards where the border border people have been placed. You will find many, 80% of the people who are there are my boy children bro with broken bones, broken spines, and they have become disabled because they were drunk and driving. The next thing is because of this substance and alcohol abuse, and my sons, I tell you, you must stop this. Many of the 61,000 inmates, 58% are men. That means the potential of this country is behind bar, and they are young people. And they get there because of defilement, most of them. Almost 50% of the cases there are defilement. And defilement is a, I'm sure it is done with a condition of mental illness. And that tells me with all this abuse of alcohol, drugs, illicit uh, uh, bruise, and all the manner of drugs they are taking, they end up there. I've gone to several prisons, and the people who are there, again, are youths who have been caught in these defilement cases. Many of them are there for 20 years, 30 years, life, 50 years. And they are 23 years, 24 years, 35 years. When you are 25 years and you are put in for 50 years, you want to tell me you will have a life after that? My sons, can you speak back to me? Do you think after 50 years you will have any life? And when you hear me now coming to speak about the boy child, as a mother, I am very, very sad. Because institutions of higher learning are places where education is meant to make you equal in every way. Because education is an equalizer. But if you cannot be able to get yourself through education, being sober, and being able to get that degree and go out to do what appertains to that degree, I can tell you, at the end of the day, your destiny shall be destroyed. And I want just to speak to you like a mother and remind you that the Bible is a no time scripture and a book that is timeless. And there was a mother that spoke to the son. And one day that son became the king. And it is the most read proverb, proverb 31. It was written to a son speaking and paid in tribute to a mother. And this is proverb 31. And I'll speak from verse 1. To verse 6. It says, The saying of King Lamuel, an inspired utterance his mother taught him. Listen, my son, listen, son of my womb, listen, my son. The answer to my prayer. Do not spend your strength on women. Do not spend your strength on what? <laughs> women are dangerous. As much as we are good, there are some who are dangerously dangerous. Don't go near them. This is what the mother told this son. 
Do not spend your strength on women. You have vigor on those who ruin kings. So there are those women who are good, who can build a king. But there are others who will destroy your kingship and destroy your destiny. Women. He went, she went on to speak to the son and saying, It is not for the kings, Ramuel, it is not for the kings to drink wine. To drink what? This mother was very wise. She was speaking to the son because she knew the son needed to grow into a man of power, a man of influence, and if that son had to rise to that level, she had to listen to the counsel and the wisdom of the mother concerning the bad women. But they are also good women, and I will talk about them. The next thing she talks about is that wine. And he, she also goes again to say, not for rulers. So men are supposed to be kings, and men are supposed to be rulers. And he says, not for rulers to crave for beer. To crave for what? Beer. Forget about this beer thing. Lest they drink and forget what has been decreed, and deprive all the oppressed their rights, and so she concluded and said, let beer be for those who are perishing. The beer is for who? And wine for those who are in anguish. And he says, all those who are poor and those who are perishing are the ones should, who should be taking beer and they should be taking wine. Are you the perishing and the poor men? So the wine and the beer is not your space. It is therefore with great honor to be here in Pwani, and, and not only Pwani, but Pwani University. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, the Dean of Students, and the entire university community for the warm reception that you have accorded my team and I to me skia tuko pwani na tuko nyumbani asante ni sana ata nimeona niko na room hapa ya rigiji kwa hivyo nikipita hapa pwani nitaingia pwani university kwa sababu hapa ni kwangu At the same time, universities should leave their ivory towers and come down to the people. You are a people who shape ideas, knowledge, and opinions of the millions of villages and in Kenya. Addressing this institution of higher learning is like addressing the nation. It is my expectation today as I face you, I'm facing the nation of Kenya and not only Kenya but the world. I am speaking to the most brilliant brains I've ever known and I'm addressing the future of Kenya and the world. This is the best place to plant seeds of great leadership and this is the place to be if we have to discuss the future of a nation. Myself and Vice Chancellor and the people you see, the leaders who are here, in another 20 years it will be our sunset and it shall be your sunrise. It is you and your children who will inherit this land, and therefore it is your business to make sure you acquire knowledge and make sure that you are developing 
this nation. It will be for you and your children. Right now, you may think it is far, but it's only after four or five years, and you will be where we are. Dear students, I'm here as your mother, as your mother, and I am concerned about the future and the well-being, and first and foremost, I must acknowledge the alarming statistics that are being given in our nation, and especially things to do with alcohol and substance abuse in this coast. Number one, in every 45 persons aged between 15 and 24 years in the coast region is addicted to alcohol. 45%. Only 5 and 50, 50. That if I count 5, the next are, <laughs> are, are alcoholics. I send 5, the next are alcoholics. I go there and as we go on, we are talking about the time bomb that our first lady has just talked about. Because if you have addicted people, you don't have a sober nation. There is no way we are going to build a nation with drunken and drugged people. This is the age bracket where we have the greatest potential, where we are expecting to harvest the brains that would drive the economy of this country. And if they are drunken, then we are in total trouble. In the last five years, new bars in the coast region have increased by 40.7%. And especially around the institutions of higher learning, even near the primary schools and the secondary schools. This is a wicked thing and it is a satanic agenda that we must combat. Children as young as 11 years old have been reported as abusing drugs in this region. More painful to a mother is that 18,000 users of in, are using injectable drugs and they are found in the coast region. These figures refer to human beings and their lives. These are referring to children who have been born by mothers like myself. We are referring to our sons. These are not statistics. These are men. These are women. These are young girls. These are our daughters who are already abusing alcohol. And soon enough, like we have already seen, as a pastor, I can tell you, for the many years, in the 22 years I've been a pastor, we have buried young men. Very many. There is a home we went and we buried one mother, buried one whose son was drunken and driving, he died. The other one was addicted and of course he died of river cancer. The other one, he was drunk, he was hit by a vehicle, he bar she buried. And the three were only sons he had, she had. And you can tell the kind of pain the parents are having when you bury all your children in the right and correct way is where the parents are buried by their children. But now we are the ones who are burying you. You must have mercy on your parents. I know we have not done a good job in bringing you up. And I know maybe you have a reason to do what you are doing. But as a mother, I have come to appeal to you. 
do not die on us. Stay alive. Can you speak to your friend and tell them, stay alive? That is a plea from a mother. Please, please, stay alive. These figures we are saying, they refer to human beings and lives. My dear students, it is time to make a choice. Live a drug-free life. It is, it is time to look into the future, not only our future, but the future of our nation. This nation looks up to you to produce the next crop of national leaders. What nation will thrive on a drunken population? We need a sober nation. I urge you to remain focused and be best, the best that you can be. Live a dignified life and know that this nation and the world awaits you to build and to make it a better place than you found it. My dear students, as a champion of the boy child, I cannot forget to talk to you about my boy children. This is the best subject that I ever want to speak about. And now I think men can smile and say ahoy. Hi, hapa kosi kwani tukoje. Ahoy. Can I hear the bass? <laughs> you all know, <laughs> for the longest time, the boy child has faced unspeakable neglect in our society and it is not getting any better. Without strong boy children, I do not know whom a strong woman or girl child can live with. The world must acknowledge the important role that the boy children play in their society. They are the seed carriers, they are the fathers, they are the leaders of today and tomorrow, and they hold the key to shaping a better future and a better nation. My dear boy children, as you hear them calling me mama boys, and I'm not ashamed to be called that. And I will continue to advocate for you. I said I will speak about this boy child until every individual wakes up in the morning from their bed. They are saying boy child, boy child. And they just have to do something about it. <laughs> My dear boy child, children, stand tall, be strong and lead with integrity and humility. Your potential is limitless, and I have no doubt that you will achieve great things. Embrace your responsibility with pride and determination for all our leaders of our country. We must never forget the importance of uplifting the boy child and providing for them with the support and the guidance that they need to succeed. My dear students, I vividly remember my days in Kenyatta University where I learned the value of hard work, perseverance, and developing strong relationship with my peers and mentors. These lessons have stayed with me throughout my career and personal life. I urge you to make the most of your time in Pwani University. Take every opportunity for growth and learning and strive to be the best version of yourself. You have the potential to achieve great things and I believe in your ability to succeed. I leave you with a word of counsel from the Bible again because that is what guided me. And many of you, when you look at me and you hear I am the second lady, I believe there are some who follow me in my Facebook. 
and I give this testimony so that it can encourage someone. I come from very obscure background and I would be the last person if had God was not on my side and I didn't have a strong mother who prayed for us. My father died when I was very young and as you may know, widows suffer just like the boy children now. Nobody wanted to see my mother after my dad died in two years when she knew her. Even those people who used to be friends to my father, they would not even want us to visit them. My bro the brothers of my mom, they didn't want us in their homes. And my mom was left with eight children, four girls and four boys. In two years, even the land which our father had left us because there was a loan in a bank, it was sold. And the people who bought the land was the brothers of my dad. And we were thrown out of the land. My dad having been an orphan, we went to my mother's side. And my grandmother had a rough time trying to keep us in her house. The bro my mother's brothers, my uncles, they thought because he, she had four boys and she could not leave them anywhere. That's why I really must advocate the cause of a boy child. My brothers were innocent. They didn't mind the girls, but they minded our brothers. And since my mom could not leave my brothers outside, we had all to be sent away from my grandmother's house. And we stayed in a chicken pen outside my grandmother's house. Reason that these sons would not come and inherit from whatever my grandmother had. And as we were staying there, it was cold. July, I remember, we lost our last born to pneumonia. And when they came to help us bury our daughter or our sister, they told us we would die like her outside there. But you can tell God is a good God. I'm here to give a testimony. And after she died, my mom realized it was not a job she could lose all her children. So she moved from Moranga, we went to Thika, and we, I grew up in a ghetto called Kiandutu in Thika. So when I talk about the struggles and many things that maybe you are experiencing today, you may not have gone through what I went through. By the time even we left, Donyo Shege, where I'm born, we didn't even have clothes to wear. We were wearing our father's shirt, and I would wear it from Monday to Sunday. At that time, we were working as maids in our uncle's houses. And when they went to, 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 the, to, to the church on Sunday, we would run to the river, we would remove, stay naked, wash it, wait for it to dry, then we would come back to continue with the work. And we were young children. Even I don't know how we survived, Bishop. I have no idea how we did it. And regardless of all the issues that we went through, God still took us to better schools. Myself and my brother went to Alliance to the alliances, my sister went to <laughs> Roreto convent, another one went to Chania, and we all finished school. And we didn't have school fees. And I remember telling people that when we passed, shake, when we passed standard seven, because as we went to the other system, you know, people have been asking, how did she go to St. Francis and she went also to Alliance? There was a system where you went to Form 4, that, that was called secondary school, 
and you went four years and two years you went to high school. So you could choose to move from one school to another to go to high school. And it came to the time that we needed to go to the Alliance then. We did not have even boxes, we did not have uniform, we did not have fees, we did not even know where it was. But our mom told us you'll go to secondary school. And with prayer, she, one day, that day, when we, material day, when we were supposed to go, we did not have the fees, we did not even know where to go, but we had one word of our mother, wait, at midday, you will go some, you will go to school. So we were inside, and she told us, just sit there, she took a stool like that one, she sat outside, and she told us not to talk to her, she was praying. She prayed until midday, and the DC called Duo Kefadi of that day, came to ask to inquire whether we had gone to school. And he's the one who took us to school, bought us everything, and paid one year for us. I'm saying all this to encourage you and to tell you that there are times you will go through challenges, but you do not have to do the wrong thing. You don't have to drink wine. You don't have to take bangi. You don't have, God will come through in a very special way. Remain in God. Trust in God. Trust also in yourself and the work you do. I would like you to know that there is a great potential in you. And we passed. I went to St. Francis from high school and went to Kenyatta University. After that, I was a banker for 16 years. I retired in 2006. And here I am, the second lady of the Republic of Kenya. And so your background, because many of you, when you are here in Pwani University, you may have come from different backgrounds. Your background has nothing to do with your success. If my background has had everything to do with what I am, I can tell you I will not be here. I'm the most unexpected candidate to be standing here. But because my destiny line has something to do with a God who is not, who does not even consult with my mother or from anybody, even you, you will make it. Imagine I, want, I contemplated suicide one hours in the university. It's not, of course, because of a boyfriend, no. <laughs> Even good things can cause you to want to commit suicide. And that's why we say mental illness is a real thing. I had done a great thing with the allowances that we used to, to call boom. I decided to get out of the university hostels and with the little that I had, I bought my mother a wardrobe, I bought her some sofa, I bought her the gas cooker, and I was very happy with myself. Just to be called after a month, the gas had exploded and the neighbor, one of the neighbors had died in our house. And people were saying, uh, talking about my mom and she was so stressed, she was crying because she had not done anything. It was an accident. And so I felt that I, I did the wrong thing and I felt so guilty about it. I wanted to kill myself because I had done the wrong thing. Until someone, a friend of mine, and that's why you must keep good friends and you must be able to talk to someone. When you are in distress, have someone good, friend whom you can talk to. This lady was called Nkirote. And she came and told me, she found me in the room. 
and actually I was contemplating suicide. She told me there was a trip they were going to State House that time, the university students used to go and visit Moy in 1987. I remember, it, I think it was July 17, 1987. I don't know whether you are bored. <laughs> that day, that fateful day, because of a friend, I'm alive today. A good friend. So you must keep right company and have good friends. And learn to confine to people. Had I not talked to that girl that day, I would not be here. And what was the, the issue? I was just <laughs> I was just guilty about something. I had done something good. And when I went to see my mom, she told me, had you committed suicide now myself, I would have also committed suicide. See the kind of destruction that would have been there. My siblings would not have had um, a mother. Myself, would, I would not be here. And therefore, I urge you, as you stay in this university, please make the right choices. Keep off drugs. In my office, I have seen serious trouble with the boy child. When I decided I'm your advocate, the first place I landed was Shimansi, the dance here. And when I went there, I've seen, I saw what I never imagined. Your brothers are there, they are dying. They have used drugs. Some of them have injected themselves. They have no place to inject themselves. They are doing it in the chest, waiting to die. Don't go there, please. I'm trying to get them out, and many of them are trying to change. And it is taking a long time for them to turn around. Right now, 70 of them are in various uh, rehab centers, and I have 300 who have registered and they want to go to the rehabilitation. I don't want I bring out your brothers and then you can't go into that space. I would ask you to remain sober, focus in your studies and come out tops. And I know it is going to happen. Yvonne, you can hold on and hope because there is a hope. The Bible always tells us, even when it is, the tree is cut and it's dry, when dew is put on it, it can sprout again. So whoever it is that is listening to me, and you are feeling hopeless, I have come to encourage you. And many of us, them who are watching, please stay sober. And you speak to my, your sister and your brother next to you, tell them stay sober and stay alive that is what the, my ma your mother asks you and i know many of you now maybe you, as you sit there you are saying you you have no idea what the kind of a parent i have <laughs> we don't even understand you ourselves i'll tell you the truth we don't understand you at all. And most of the times why you see us behaving in the way we behave is because we are afraid. We are afraid to lose you. And so, because sometimes when we talk to you, we find that you become so tough, you look fragile, and maybe you may go and commit suicide, we decide to keep quiet. That's the truth. As parents, we don't know. You are facing different times. Ours was different. The technological <laughs> evolution that has taken place. You people, you are forever writing on, we don't know what you are writing. We wish we could just peep and know what is it my son or my daughter is doing. 
But again, you come, hi, mommy, bye, mommy, you rock yourself in your rooms. We are no longer friends. We no longer engage. And we are afraid to come and find you in your rooms. You want your space. You tell us to not to get into your space. We used to be friends. But nowadays, even when we knock, you ask, why, why are you disturbing me? And since we do not want to interfere with your life, we don't know exactly what to do with our sons and our daughters. But one thing I can tell you, your parents love you. And what you see is fear of losing you. And so when you go home and they don't want you to go for your bash, you think they are tough. We talk tough sometimes, but actually we are not tough, we are just afraid. Because we don't know with the kind of environment you go and find yourself. With the wicked people who are around, that when you go to those bashes, there is somebody else who is wicked enough that if you leave a drink, they will raise it with drugs and you will not know. And finally you end up driving when you are in drugs and even you yourself, you don't know. So as parents, we live in fear of losing our children. And we know that you have grown up, we have to let you go. But as we let you go, we would also want to be your friends. There is nobody who can advise you better than your mother. Nobody who can do you better, advise you better than your father. And if those two cannot, please go to the spiritual fathers and mothers. Find somebody when you are in trouble, when you are frustrated, when you are stressed, in fact, we are looking in ways of coming up with helplines across all the religions so that you can call us anytime and you don't have to feel alone. We are trying. Will you help us? Will you forgive us? I am here to apologize for all the mothers and fathers for the wrongs we have done. Sometimes we didn't do. Have you forgiven them? Yes. Please forgive us. And engage with us. Try us and you will see. Your parents love you. And above all, my boy children, I love you. Love you Is that how you love your mother? Hmm? I love you. Mwah! And I will do what it takes to advocate your case. But for you also, you must prove yourself by doing what is right. God bless you. God honor you. And I'm sure I have just been asked by the sons who came here and they say they are going somewhere for a trip i think for a competition i will buy you two pairs of uniform i will pay for your transport and accommodation you said you needed about uh, 35,000, but I'll give you 100,000. <laughs> but you must win. <laughs> That's all I'm asking of you. I pray and I know you will win. The other thing that I want to do so that I'll be coming often Mweshimiwa and our first lady, we want to adapt the football team of Pwani University. <laughs> but you must produce now the best. Yeah? I want to see the best, the finest. Are you able to do that? Yes. 
and perhaps within the campus, I can sponsor a tournament. Yeah. I don't know what my girls do, but we can also have a tournament of football or whichever you do. Which one are you doing, girls? Netball. Okay, I will sponsor both. The netball and football. So my chief of staff, we are going to have the netball and football. And I want to see, they start the preliminaries. I'll come at the quarterfinals. Are we ready for it? Yes. And uh, the winner will get 500,000 for me. Let's do what can make us happy and do the right things, right? Yes. So now you have two teams. You have the one for the girls. You have the one for my boys. And I, you can start any time. If you want to start tomorrow, I don't mind. But uh, I will come and I see. I will be watching. I will be sending people to see what you are doing. On top of that, with the permission of the Vice Chancellor and the board, we would like to start a computer a, a hub here, an ICT hub. <laughs> where some of you can come and you can, you can actually get jobs online. We must start knowing how to create jobs and to make our children busy and give them activities they can use their energy on. That is what a mother is. A mother is to just create situations so that the children are busy. And when you are busy, I know you'll be directing your energy in the right place, and I don't have to worry, and I spend sleepless night. God bless you, God all night. Asante sana mgeni wetu rasmi. Wapi makofi shangwe na vigele gele oe. Nitaomba kwa ruhusa yako mgeni rasmi tuweze kuketi. Nikiwalika vijana wale dancers waje hapa moja kwa moja wale vijana dancers waweze kupokezwa mzigo moja kwa moja. Wapi makofi yao jameni wanapokuja hawa vijana watapiga